Vanderbilt Center of Excellence for Children in State Custody. I'm here to introduce today's speaker. Uh, John Ebert typically does these introductions. Uh, he certainly wishes he could be here today to introduce uh, the special speaker and friend, former colleague of ours. Uh, but John had another training that he's conducting as we speak. So as you, a little housekeeping stuff, as you signed in on your way in, if you didn't sign in, please sign in uh, as you leave. But once you sign in, then you're going to be uh, sent an email. It's a satisfaction survey. So you should receive that automatically. And we do ask that you take the time to fill out that brief survey and uh, give us any kind of feedback that you'd like to offer us about these trainings. Um, another point is that this is the final lunch and learn of 2018. We're not going to meet for December. We just skipped that month. And we're going to pick back up in January uh, with more of these monthly trainings. Uh, but at, on to our speaker today, uh, Dr. Patty Van Ace. Uh, she's a long-term friend of the COE. She, we wouldn't be here gathering for Lunch and Learn without her. She founded Lunch and Learn. She started all this. Um, you know, a few people meeting in a small room, five to ten people. Uh, you know, we had close to 200 people registering uh, here and online because we are streaming online. So I forgot to welcome all of you who are out there uh, in the internet world joining us. Um, but Patty Van Eisen was our former clinical director at the COE and she spent 17 years of her career at Vanderbilt uh, at teaching at Peabody and working with graduate students as well. Uh, so she is part of the COE's formative year. She's one of the, the major uh, founders of the COE and has helped shape the work that we do and the people that we work with. So. We're very excited today to have Patty, Dr. Patty Van Ace speaking with us. Let's give her a real warm round of applause. Thanks. Thank you. It's great to see everybody here today. And I know a lot of you, so hi to those of you who I haven't said hi to yet um, that um, I've known from here or other places. Um, I am currently working with Omnivisions, which is a large foster care company um, here in Tennessee, we also have children in Kentucky and North Carolina. Um, I'm just going to ask, just in, just because there might be somebody out there, do I have any foster parents here? Yeah, wonderful. Um, just you two. Anybody else on this side? Okay, I just thank you for being here. Um, the work of the foster parent is where the heart of everything happens for the healing of our kids. Um, you all are so important. Thank you for being here and thank you for all that you do. Um, do I have anybody here who's working with foster children just in general? Let me see your hands. Okay, great. And the rest of you are working with some other kind of child or adult um, situation in mental health, I'm assuming, or in this, um, the child welfare system? Wonderful. Well, thanks for being here today. Um, I am going to talk to you about a, a topic, dissociation, that tends to be, um, I think, it, it seems like a mystery to a lot of people. I'm going to try to bring it down to some understandable form of conversation for us here. It's still going to be a mystery when we leave, though, because we as a field don't know quite enough about what's really happening at the level of the brain to fully understand it, but we're getting there. You can see that the picture here on the screen has some splits. This is a picture of a seven-year-old child. I'm going to talk about her quite a lot later, um, but we're going to call her Cheyenne, and of course all names have been changed um, for the children that we discuss. But this is a child who's seven years old, and you can see kind of this split here in the middle. Everybody notice that? And down here you have, a, you have two hearts, one on each side. This side also has a, a, a brokenness or a kind of a split in it. Oftentimes with persons with dissociation, when you look at their drawings, you're going to see these kinds of splits or divisions um, because the essence of dissociation is a blocking off in the brain of segmented parts. So oftentimes in drawings, you'll see that. So just be aware of what your clients are putting on paper. And I'll tell you a lot more about this young girl later, but you can see she has a boy half and a girl half. 
the eyes, if you could see, uh, the colors are, don't really show up as well here, but they're different colors. Um, she has definitely shown me right off the bat her fragmentation. So what we hear from um, our foster parents is that there's a lot of perplexing behaviors, and we're going to talk about those. Those perplexing behaviors that our children are exhibiting in our schools, by the way, do I have teachers here? Any teachers? Okay. Um, oftentimes, it, it, uh, these perplexing behaviors show up in the classroom, right? Because the kids spend so much time there, or in the homes, or in our offices. But the origins of the dissociation response comes from what we call complex trauma. How many of you have heard the term complex trauma? Great, this is a sophisticated group. So you know that complex trauma are those events that occur in the early formative years of the child's developing brain. These very difficult events like chronic sexual abuse or domestic violence, physical abuse, profound neglect. Actually, we've learned that profound neglect is the most damaging on the developing brain. Those kind of chronic and multiple events in the context of the developing brain, in the context of the family, that is what creates the complex trauma. Remember that the early brain is laying down a million neural connections every second. You with me? A million neural connections, nerves that nerve cells that are in that developing brain finding each other and wiring up a million per second in the first 18 months of life. Wow. That developing brain doubles in size in the first year. It's 80% its adult volume by age three. What happens from birth to age three in that developing brain is absolutely phenomenal and it's laying down wiring that is helping that child adapt to whatever environment he or she finds themselves in. So if the environment is abusive and chronically toxic and, and the abuse is happening at the hands of the persons who should be protecting, nurturing, caring for the child, the developing brain must adapt to its current environment, right? It has to wire up for survival. We're beginning to get more neuroscience about dissociation and how it forms, but this is where we really believe that severe dissociation begins in those early years with this complex trauma type of environment. You'll see that the hallmark of complex trauma is dysregulation. These are the perplexing behaviors, extreme shifts in mood, unexplainable shifts in behavior. The child was just fine and seemingly unprovoked. She's now aggressive toward the sibling in the room. You didn't see the, 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 the trigger there. It may have come from the inside of the child, an internal state. Um, dysregulation of biology, a child who is not able to have routine sleep because those rhythms that should have happened in infancy are not in place. Children who are having trouble with their toileting um, when they should be toilet trained, troubles with biology, somatic painful complaints that don't have a, a, a true origin, a medical origin. Um, so you've got dysregulation in emotion, we call that affect, mood shifts, relationships, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I'm going to push you away, I'm going to, and now I want you close, I'm going to push you away, um, just very confusing um, concept of trust and attachment. So complex trauma is the underlying condition that creates the dissociation. So what about these perplexing behaviors? I'm going to tell you a few that are just from my more recent history with, um, with kids. I went to a residential treatment center not too long ago where the, the staff had called me and they said, oh, they called me Dr. Patty, Dr. Patty, please come, please come, because we've got this kid, he's 14 years old, and he keeps pulling the fire alarm, he just keeps pulling the fire alarm. 
We've given him every consequence in the book. We've given him incentives. We've tried to give him attention in other ways. We think he's just attention seeking. We don't really know, but please come and help us. So I go and I, and I interview this young man. And uh, in the interviewing um, with him, I'm beginning to wonder about his insides. What does he experience on his insides? What does it feel like inside of him? And he, and, and he begins to tell me about a part that he'd not told anybody else about. And he labeled it angry part. It's angry part that's active pulling that fire alarm. It's angry part. And this child knew that his body went and pulled the fire alarm. It wasn't like he was blanked out from it, but he was drawn to do it through this part that compelled him to do it. So I began to wonder if Angry Part could hear me. Is Angry Part there? Is Angry Part know I'm here? First of all, I want to know if I'm safe, right? Um, and he said, he, he kind of said, yeah, Angry Part's listening. And I said, what Angry Part, do I have permission to like talk to Angry Part and let, and, or can you talk to Angry Part and uh, let me tell him a thing or two? And, and, and the young man said, sure. And so I wondered with, with the child if Angry Part knew where he was. And Angry Part still thought he was in the birth home where he was locked in closets routinely. Now this child's in residential treatment locked in. You following? Angry Part thought he was still in the past. That part was segmented off from this young man's awareness. Um, my child that I was talking to, I'll call him Jay. Jay knew where he was, but this other part was still stuck. So I took the opportunity to explain to Angry Part that he was at this residential treatment center. And that if, and, and I learned through the Jay telling me that Angry Part was just trying to get outside. He didn't want to be locked up. So we, I, we told Angry Part, listen, you can ask a staff and they will take you outside for a walk and you can get fresh air whenever you want to. So this was communicated. That child never pulled the fire alarm again. And it had been a daily horrendous, you can imagine a residential treatment center, everybody running out and getting crazy on us. Um, Jay, uh, Jay was absolutely turned um, now that the, the, the angry part had had a chance to be heard and understood and his therapy began to take off to where he was much healthier at this point. Another perplexing behavior, um, a, a young girl recently in foster care who whose team called and said, oh, we've got to do something about this child. Uh, we'll call her Judy. Judy is pooping in her pull-ups 12 times a day and sometimes smearing the poop. And there are six other kids in the home, and they are, um, and, and this is just, I, the, the foster mom's like, I don't think I can keep this child. It's just too much mess. It's too much chaos. She's putting it on everybody's stuff. I have a child with mitochondrial disease, and that is going to infect her. We can't do this. So um, do y'all want to know what, how old this child was? Ten. Ten. Okay, that's weird, right? So I go do an assessment, and yes, again, once discovered, that this child had an imaginary friend, which I'm going to talk to you about today, how to do an imaginary friend kind of interview. She had an imaginary friend, and the imaginary friend was doing, there were a whole lot of behaviors this child had. The imaginary friend was the more defiant type of part. Um, but in the, in the interviewing of the child, I wondered if there was any other part that she might know about on the inside, because I had hypothesized there was a very young part in there that was pooping, and the imaginary friend was 10 also. So she, she, I said, just you know, scan on the inside and see if there's another part we need to be aware of that might be responsible for the pooping, because this child couldn't feel herself when she pooped. Her bottom didn't feel the poop coming out. She was dissociated from the feeling of her bowels. That's that bodily fragmentation, that bodily dysregulation. So she, I just asked her to get quiet and kind of look on the inside and just wonder if there's any other part of her she becomes aware of that 
is compelled to poop and she looked on the inside she went down she closed her eyes and all of a sudden she put her hands right here on her stomach and she said there's a gate right here dissociative kids have closed off fragmented parts of their brain walled off one from the other so when she said gate it made sense to me there's a gate and there's somebody behind it I asked her to explore that and she said it's a two-year-old or maybe a four-year-old and this was the beginning of the discovery of a part that was responsible for the pooping and now we're working with her with specialized treatment for dissociative disorder and she's coming a long long way it's amazing the progress she's made now that that part has been heard and understood because we know about this child's history she was very very much abused sexually physically emotionally domestic violence and at a certain point in time this part took on all of those feelings and um, memories and broke it off so that Jay didn't have, Judy didn't have to experience it. Perplexing behavior that now once we figure out what's going on underneath makes some sense. But to the foster mom, this is a 10 year old pooping her pull up 12 times a day and smearing it all over her house. That's bad stuff, right? To the residential treatment provider, that's a kid that's creating chaos every single day. Um, I'm going to tell you about one other uh, young girl that came to my office. She had trichotillomania, pulling out her hair, and she would pull out the hair from cats and dogs also. And while she pulled out the hair from cats and dogs, she would make their mouths, like hold their mouths shut while she pulled out their hair. Very vicious, very aggressive. Um, she would collect her urine in a Febreze bottle and spray it all over her room. Uh, she recently wet her bed and put her snack of cookies in the urine in the morning, smearing the chocolate cookies then all over the walls of her room. This is perplexing, difficult behavior. She used to blow her nose mucus into her hand and smear it on herself, and sometimes on peers at school. Perplexing behaviors, what's behind that? These sound like big, weird, huge behaviors, but the behaviors that are also reported a lot are just things like this. It seems like the, the, the child just zones out, she's just not there, she spaces out, it's kind of like, hello, anybody home? Foster parents will say their eyes go blank or their eyes kind of roll, and it's like they're not there anymore. And it's like even when you call their name, it's hard to bring them back. They're just in their own world. We hear that a lot from our foster parents, this sort of leaving and zoning out and spacing out. Uh, we hear about extreme mood shifts, which sometimes gets labeled bipolar illness, when perhaps we need to take a, a closer look because it may be regressive shifts of parts and regress it like angry part coming out. Um, extreme shifts in behaviors, we've talked already about that. Um, regressions like a child seems um, uh, grown up and suddenly they've regressed into baby talk and baby walk to the point of the parents saying we have to carry them because they can no longer walk. I've had several uh, like, like that. This same little girl that was pulling out the hair and, smear and smearing her mucus, um, she was in my office, and I'm just referring to my, my notes here so I get it right, but we were playing um, and doing a kind of a play interview. This is a seven-year-old, and she straightened up suddenly and looked around my office like she didn't recognize it, just kind of like exploring it for the first time. And I gently asked her about something from the morning session. We'd been together all morning, then we'd taken a lunch break, and then we'd come back. And she looked around trying to figure out how to answer the question. What we hear from our foster parents, what I see in kids, is if they don't know the answer, and they're dissociative, and they've lost time, and they've bleeped out, they try to figure out what answer would make sense to you. So for example, my pooping child, Judy, she'd come in, and her foster mother would go, <laughs> did you poop and she'd watch the girl kind of go and feel herself and she'd go uh-huh why didn't you come why didn't you come in and use the toilet and then she watches the child search for an answer um 
I didn't want to stop playing. But what was really happening, we learned with this child, is she had never felt the poop. She didn't even know it was there until the foster mom pointed it out to her. And then she had to figure out, well, why didn't I? But she can't remember because she was blanked out when she did it. So this child is bl has been blanked out. Now she doesn't know where she is. She's looking around for a clue, and she's trying to figure out where she was. And she finally said, I was here one time with Miss Kathy, which, um, she had come to see me years before with a, with a different foster mom. And I had told her that when I first met her this day. I said, you know, you, you were four years old. I first met you, and you were with Miss Kathy. And I had told her that at the beginning of the day. Um, so she had switched. And then she, um, then, she, then she went on to this. She just made that up. And then she went on to describe herself and her sister Rose as twins who were going to get babies soon. And this persona, this part of her, all of a sudden wasn't seven years old. This was like a 12 year old or maybe a 15 year old. We're going to get babies. We're both going to raise them together. And by the way, my sister Rose and I are twins, which they weren't. Her sister Rose was 15 years old. She presented um, kind of as this teenager with poise. She was no longer anxious. She'd been very anxious. She appeared very sure of herself. And then she asked me how old I was and if I had any babies. And then a colleague knocked on the door. This was when I was at the COE and during this time that she was this sort of 15 year old. And they said, um, and, and, and she kind of changed back into that anxious kind of hyper kid that she had been before. And so, um, so I went back to the conversation after the colleague left, and I said, so you and Rose are twins? And she convincingly, convincingly stated, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. This is the story we get from foster parents a lot, is that the kids that we later learn are dissociative, that they lie. They lie all the time. And what we have to begin to wonder about is, are they lying? Or really, did they have gaps in their memory, like this kid? Or they shifted and switched, and now they really don't know the answer. So perplexing behaviors might be dissociation. Dissociation from our DSM-5, which is our diagnostic manual, uh, is defined as a disturbance in the ongoing continuity in the normal integration disturbance in the ongoing continuity in the normal integration wholeness of our consciousness, wholeness and integration of our memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. When we have a diagnosis of dissociation, we have a disturbance in the continuous experience of the integrated self. <clears throat> On the dissociation continuum, we have non-pathological dissociation. It's, it's, it's okay, we all have it. And then we have pathological dissociation. Daydreaming is a non-pathological uh, type of phenomenon. We all do that. Um, another one would be being absorbed in a book or video game. How many of you have been absorbed in something like that? Somebody walks in the room, you don't know they're there. They, they might have to call your name several times. We've all done that. That's dissociation. Highway hypnosis. I went 50 miles the wrong direction on I-40 after doing a consult one day. I did it. was doing a consult in Lebanon. And when I, quote, woke up, I was in Putnam County. <laughs> I was supposed to be coming back to Nashville where I live. And honestly, it was that sense of, you know, I was like, gosh, you know, it's been about 50, 45, 50 minutes. I should be home. I should be getting to my exit. So then I woke up, looked at the next exit, and I'm like, holy smoly, I'm in Cookville. <laughs> oh, man, that's highway hypnosis. Zoning out at a lecture. The thing about normal non path oh, I know another one. We've all done this. This one we've all done. You're reading a book. And suddenly you're at the bottom of the page and you're like, I have no idea what I just read. <laughs> but the thing is, we know it. We know we just didn't read that page. We return back to being in the present and we, we know, oh, okay, I just missed about three minutes of reading a book. 
but we know that, right? We still have an integration and a continuous experience of who we are in that moment, unless we don't, unless we are dissociative. And then there's this unusual experience of losing time, gaps in time. Maybe looking at the clock, uh, being in the classroom, and then all of a sudden the, clock's, the clock says 1220 right now, then kind of coming to and the clock says quarter to one. And I don't remember what happened between in those minutes. And I as a kid might notice that like, huh, how did it get that late? particularly if the time of day has changed it like the light of the day right so it was noon and now all of a sudden you kind of wake up and it's 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 dusk and you you know the last thing you can remember was noon at lunch in school and suddenly you're walking home from the bus and you're like what and so kids who are dissociative have this experience sometimes where they just have these gaps we call it amnesia so we have the same thing, and this is why I really want to debunk the myth of dissociation, that it's something so weird and out there. You have it. You dissociate. I dissociate. We all dissociate. Our brains know how to do it. So it's not that big of a stretch if somebody's been in these early conditions of pathological trauma, complex trauma, in an environment that could not keep them safe. There was nowhere to go for the brain to have a safe resting place. So the brain adapted by wiring up not being there. Now that's, that's severe. The, the kids I've talked to you about are fairly severe dissociation. Uh, the first boy with angry part is less severe than some of the other kids I've, uh, that I've told you about. But what happens in pathological dissociation is that there's a structural division within the self that causes this disturbance and this fragmentation in our normal integration of who we are and how we think and how we remember and how we perceive and how we behave. We lose these chunks of time, don't remember anything. People with dissociation can be watching themselves like they're over there, like they're doing something and they're over here watching their body do something that they're not willing it to do. Uh, th these, these persons can feel like they're in kind of a dream world. Is this really real or am I kind of watching a movie? Or it could be kind of foggy. So those two phenomena are called depersonalization and derealization. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But the sense that someone else is controlling their actions, that one is like Jay who was pulling the fire alarm. He sensed that angry part came and did that. And that he didn't, he didn't have control to say, no, don't pull the fire alarm. It's like the angry part took over his arm and his hand. And kids will tell me this. I saw my body doing that, and I didn't want it to. Um, so having the, then having inside parts or states that act independently like that is severe dissociation. So everybody knows we're on a continuum, right? Everybody got that. Um, there was a story in the New Yorker, if you're interested, um, it was in April, and there was a Yale University psychiatrist, Dr. Krasner, who read this article about this young woman. She was a teacher, very high functioning person, and she went into a dissociative fugue state. In other words, she got, am she got amnesia, she lost, her, she lost her identity for a, a while, she was wandering the streets, she ended up in various places. She was finally found, of course her family desperately looking for her, several weeks just missing, did not know who she was. She went into a dissociative fugue state. And um, people began to say, oh, she's just doing that for attention. It's not really true. She's making it up. She's staging it. And um, this psychiatrist had, a, had a, uh, some concerns that he wrote in this article. He said that um, people were very condemning and discrediting of her experience. And he said, I think this speaks to the rage that dissociative conditions uh, incur in certain people. And there's an, kind of an inexpressible quality to dissociative, dissociative states. It's hard for me to stand up here and try to express to you what it really is. He actually called it an ineffable quality. And I had to look that word up. And it means inexpressible or undescribable. 
So I learned a new vocabulary word from his quote. Um, but, but these dissociative symptoms challenge a conventional understanding of what we consider reality. Dissociative disorders challenge our reality. So I want you to look at this quote here, the rest of his quote. Dissociative fugue is the rare bird of dissociation, but dissociation as a phenomenon is very common. I think as a field, we have not done our due diligence in part because the phenomenon is so frightening. It's terrifying to think that we're all vulnerable to a lapse in selfhood. It's terrifying. When we become afraid as people, we tend to avoid, dismiss, um, condemn. We do that as human beings. And this is one of those conditions in mental health that has, that, that where this may have been occurring. Um, now again, I, I want to be very clear that even in pathological dissociation, there are, there's a continuum from mild to severe. So not everyone with dissociation has these inside parts that I've talked about with these several kids. But there are more people with pathological dissociation than we, uh, I think, than we've been picking up. We're calling it other things. We'll talk about that. So how does it form? The child is in this early complex trauma environment. They are so afraid and the baby can't escape. They can't flee. They can't fight. They can potentially freeze. So they're gonna go into survival mode if their very survival is being challenged. A child who's neglected is going to go into survival terror if he or she is starving, if they are hungry because the only way to get food is from, is from the caregiver and they can't get it. Their brain will go into survival terror, into toxic stress and begin to adapt to that environment. What we believe is happening, and there are some theoreticians who have written about this, Alan Shore is one of those, um, believing that the right hemisphere of the brain, in, in, in his theory, is wiring up the foundation for dissociation. It's laying the platform for dissociation so that that baby doesn't have to be here and feel the terror and be so in so much pain and suffering that the, that the psychic mechanisms wire up for this sort of gating off of the experience, which is also why some of our behaviors are so perplexing in the kids we serve, because they come from infancy and they are body held. They are not in language because they happen pre-verbally. So we've got kids who have internal somatic body triggers Maybe they're hungry and that triggers that survival terror of being starved. Then they're gonna do something really wacky, perplexing behaviors. Maybe when they were small, they were smacked around or shaken when they cried. And maybe they watched their mother be smacked around and hurt when, and, and loud voices in the home. So when they hear loud voices or even when they cry themselves, it might trigger them to perplexing behaviors. The child finds this way of, of blocking off, dissociating those terrifying events from memory and can block off those terrifying feelings of pain, hurt, rage, and they can dissociate or block off bad thoughts about himself and those hurting him. If it's a mild response, and it may be a child who is, you know, let's say this is starting in their their history when they're three or four, and they're not baby babies, and they are experiencing domestic violence toward their caregiver, and they can't escape the situation, and they can't help their mother, that child might go into a trance state or a spacing out state. That may be a mild dissociation. It's still pathological, because if that child's in the classroom and feeling distracted by raised voices and bleeps out, he or she's gonna lose out on learning. It still can be pathological, even though mild, if they space out a lot. He may become unaware of his surroundings, that's moderate dissociation, like I don't know where I am, or he may separate completely from himself and get these parts and totally escape those frightening events, that's severe dissociation. The children and adults that we serve with these backgrounds may have some dissociation. Again, even now you're on the pathological side, but it can be mild, moderate, or severe. Moderate dissociation, when children are trying to escape the terrifying circumstances, 
may develop, they may develop this um, depersonalization or derealization. How many of you diagnose uh, PTSD in the people that you serve? Anybody diagnosing PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? So you know that there's a, uh, a type of PTSD that's with dissociation. Um, the types of dissociation that we diagnose into PTSD is depersonalization and derealization. This is again where we separate from the body experience or we feel like things aren't really real and it's hard to remember later if it was real or not real. But later on if children have learned how to survive through depersonalization or derealization, later the same reminders of terror by sounds or smells or sight uh, or internal states can activate that same response even though they're safe right now. That's why the behaviors are so perplexing because it's like this kid's safe in my home. What's going on here? This kid's safe in my classroom. I didn't see anything that would have would have aroused this kid but if you paid attention there might have been something. Maybe that ambulance siren way in the distance down there on Broadway but you could hear it in the classroom way in the distance. Maybe that was the trigger. It may have been there and we didn't know it. Um, but these, these moderately dissociated folks might be diagnosed with PTSD with dissociation. There's also a diagnosis that's called depersonalization, derealization disorder, which is a little more toward the frequent intense side, um, more so than PTSD with. So um, I, I was in a an evaluation with a 15 year old girl I'd been called on her because she was aggressing against peers all the time and her her moods would shift up and down and she would get very aggressive and and then she would um, uh, then she would feel really awful about that she that people didn't like her and she was having a hard time socially in a residential treatment center so I went to talk with this girl and in the context of talking with her two really interesting things happened one she told me that um, she didn't remember these fights she had with the girls and then she pulled up her sleeves and she showed me all her bruises. She'd say, like I have these bruises and like these cuts and I don't know where they came from. And she was so perplexed about it. And I'm, and I'm like, well, that, what, are, what are the staff telling you? Well, they're telling me that like I hit Susie and we got in a big old fight. And I'm like, and she says, but I don't remember that. And then the staff were saying she was lying. Of course you remembered that. You did it. We saw you. Da, 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 da. So then I, I, I interviewed her more and I asked her some questions um, on the adolescent dissociative experiences scale, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and she answered that sometimes she leaves her body. I said, tell me about that. She said, well, like the other day in class, we were down uh, painting a banner with red paint and I I found myself suddenly floating up above the girls that were painting and watching them, but I wasn't really there anymore, but I could still see what was going on. And I began to explore with her what might have triggered that response in her, and she had had a, a terribly a traumatic loss of her father, and this reminded her of blood, the red paint reminded her of blood. So this is a girl who had moderate dissociation. She didn't have these well-defined parts like, um, like this girl with, with the one behind the gate, but she was having perplexing behaviors. Um, and so one of the things I also learned from her, this is her quote. She said, my mind is like the entry of a laboratory. It's like I should know the code, but I don't know it. If I press on the code too many times, it goes haywire. Okay, imagine being inside a br your brain, and, and some of us have had this experience. I'm having it more and more. You're trying to find that word, you know, word finding problems. You young people may not know about this. And you're, and you're, you're fishing all around and trying to unlock, and you're like, oh, it sounds like that, and oh, it's sort of like this, and oh, what was her name, and oh, you know, I think it started with an A, and... You know, we do that, right? It's sort of like what this girl was saying, but it's like the, every, everything's barricaded behind these laboratory doors and she can't get in. And on the adolescent dissociative experiences scale, which I used to evaluate, she, she endorsed, it feels like there are walls inside my mind. And another endorsement was, I feel like my past is a puzzle 
and some pieces are missing. Do you hear the confusion in our kids who have been so, um, have experienced such pain and suffering early on that their brains are just not coherently integrated and they're trying to figure it out? She has moderate dissociation. Severe dissociation, on the other hand, in order for, to escape really life-threatening and terrifying circumstances, children may separate completely from themselves. So it feels like there's these, and there are, these separate selves you know, in the brain that hold these awful states for them. I can't be there right now, so you take it. But there's this part of their brain, part of them, that knows the memory. They mo may know it from a body feeling level, but they also, some may know it from an actual remembering. But it's over here, and it only pops up when it gets triggered. So these states can hold these unwanted thoughts and feelings. So the child can go about her daily life, right? If those thoughts and feelings were always there, the child couldn't go to school. The child couldn't go play on the basketball team. She couldn't have normality. But when they're overly stressed or reminded of the earlier trauma or terror, some of these states get activated and that's when we see these perplexing behaviors. Uh, these children may be diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder or possibly something called other specified dissociative disorder, both of which have parts that can take control of the child's body. Um, I had a little girl that I took care of many years ago before I knew much about dissociation at all. And the foster mom came to me and she said, you just won't believe this child. She can lie like nobody's business. I mean, she lies so well that if I didn't see her do the behavior with my own eyes, I'd believe she didn't do it. So let me tell you what she did, Dr. Payne. Let me tell you. We went to Walmart. We bought these jeans and these, these shirts and this... She got to pick out all her new clothes, brought them home. She had all these new clothes, wonderful things. And then she took scissors in her bedroom and cut them all up. And I found them. And I know she did it because she was the only one in the house. And I was the only other one in the house. And I know I didn't do it. So I confronted her with it. I'm like, you know, Cindy, why did you cut your new clothes? Why? And, and she said, and, and I'm here to tell you, she said, I didn't do it. And, 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 and the foster mother says, and I, I believed her. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I can't believe you. You did this. That child had parts, obviously, that had uh, taken control of, of, of her body. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Cheyenne. This is the one who drew the, the picture. She had parts, uh, Meep is one of her parts and I wanted to read make sure that I read this right to you so when I interviewed Cheyenne um, her foster she had two not she had two adoptive moms they both came to the interview they were very good historians one of the adoptive moms had been the, was the birth grandmother and she and the other mom had had Cheyenne since Cheyenne was three. And they knew her history was really, really bad with her birth mom and dad. Um, but she had lots of uh, really tough behaviors that um, they were dealing with, including she just didn't sleep. Um, so on interview, Cheyenne described several voices in her head that were very, very distressing to her. She drew a picture of the main one, Meep, that you see on the screen, who is, quote, half man, half woman, and who talks for Carrie. Carrie was the birth mom who perpetrated her sexually. She also neglected her. And she said she's the one who played with me down there, and she pointed down to her genitalia. And she said, and Brad, and, and he was the other perpetrator. Uh, this child is afraid of Meep and wants to destroy Meep. She's tried to kill Meep by sticking things in her ears because she hears Meep inside her head or covering her head with a blanket in order to smother that part. Then a newer, scary voice in, a scarier voice in her head is called Meepers, and she drew that one also up on my whiteboard, and here is that one. And this voice just terrifies Cheyenne and fights with Meep. They disagree. And she said, 
Um, she, she told me that Meep makes her frustrated because Meep tells her to tell her moms that she hates them, and she doesn't hate them, but Meep makes her say that. She said, sometimes I go away, sometimes I go away when Meep is out. That's dissociative talk. Sometimes I go to my tree. He yells so loud like sirens. She also describes sometimes looking in the mirror and, quote, seeing the one that Meep talks for, the other girl who played with me, Carrie. There's a question on the adolescent dissociative experiences scale that says, when you look in the mirror, do you see someone else? Typically, kids, even dissociative kids, say no. This is a child who told me spontaneously on interview that that happens to her. Um, anyway, she, she uh, when she was very, very small, her caregivers told me that they heard Cheyenne as a very, very small child often saying, meep, 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 meep. And they didn't think anything of it. She's just this little tiny kid saying meep, meep, meep. They just thought it was a little tiny kid saying meep, meep, meep. Um, they didn't think anything about it. Um, so uh, the child told me that Meep is not here right now in your office, Dr. Patty. Meep isn't here. Not today. Meep is in my brain, but not out. And then she told me he has a bed in my brain, and right now he's asleep. So that's a child with that very severe dissociative part. So this structural division that creates these self-states, also called parts or ego states, are these segmented, segmented parts of consciousness. And again, I've already talked about this. They create uh, changes. They take executive control sometimes. And in a kid, because they're little kids and ki little kids are goofy, we may not notice that a child is shifting parts or shifting states. It can just be, it can be like angry state. and and uh, you know, excited state that are kind of cut off in different parts. But these have been instinctively created very, they were very helpful parts for the child um, in order to carry this unwanted material. We are beginning to learn from Teicher, Sampson et al that um, there are some, there's some brain science right now where we're looking at the fMRIs of brains and beginning to notice that brain imaging is suggesting alterations of uh, conscious perception that leave a leave sort of a subcortical brain pathway there be in other words we're beginning to see evidence of where dissociation happens actually at the neuro neurostructural level or neuro neuro level um, that's exciting to me because I think when we can really figure that out and really map that out and see it, we will have a community that understands dissociation better. We'll start to have leaps and bounds in understanding it and maybe then finding more treatment avenues. The book that's been the most helpful to me is Healing the Fractured Child. It's a 2016 publication. And I highly recommend it if you are interested in learning more about dissociation. Fran Waters is a social worker who is the author. And she has taken all of the current literature and she has put it down in this book. There's a chapter for psychiatry about medications in dissociation. I've never seen that before, ever. There's chapters about the literature about child dissociation and what we know and why we know it. She has all the neuroscience that we know all packaged into this book. There's also assessment and treatment um, as well. Yeah? Um, this dissociation yes, I'm going to talk about that. Oh, you are. I sure am. So. She has a chapter in the book about differential diagnoses, yes, and she goes through every one of them and tells you how dissociation might look like psychosis and how it may or may not be like really a, 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 a major mental illness like schizophrenia or schizoaffective or bipolar, but there are internal and external auditory and visual hallucinations that we know happen in dissociation and often get, I mean, they're going to be called psychotic because that's what we are going to call it. Um, but yes, so Fran Waters gives these markers of dissociation. Here, there's two sheets of them. You have them in your handout. Um, because of, of uh, in the context of time, um, we don't have time to, to 
go into these in great detail or I won't get to other things. We've already talked about there's going to be a history of childhood traumas. If you're looking at a kid and you're wondering do they have dissociation, you begin to look for these markers. The second one's really important and I do want to talk about it. In the context of the abuse that happened early or the neglect or the chaos, um, if there was a safe adult for the child to go to, a protective adult, a protective factor, maybe an older sibling, if a child had a safe haven to go to, their likelihood of dissociation, it, they may still have dissociation, but it may be much less. Because if the brain had a safe place, it didn't have to make its own. Does that make sense? So when you're looking at history, you want to know, was there that person? Was there, was there that grandma who lived, you know, in the grandma room down there and she, that child ran to her room when the domestic violence was happening? You want to understand the protective factors. Fran Waters makes a big point of that um, because that makes all the difference. The eyes can look different, fluttering or uh, blanking out. This is what we hear from our foster parents, that the eyes change. And they will tell you, and they'll say things like, he looks like he has a demon. He looks like he's demon possessed. Because there's something so different about the eyes. If they begin to roll back or flutter, that is something that is typically a signal for internal communication. The child is internally having conversation with another part or noticing another part. There are auditory and visual hallucinations. If you ask about inside voices, usually a child, a child who knows they have inside voices, they will tell you. If you're the kind of adult who gets dissociation and you begin to ask these things, they'll look at you like, oh, you know about that. Oh yeah, I have them. And then they'll begin to tell you, typically. Memory problems and amnesia, we talked about that. Sometimes our kids will refer to we rather than I. So we went to the store, they, they, and you're like, who's we? And you'll hear that slip in language. Listen for that, because they may be talking about their parts. Um, the regressed behavior is also something to look for. Imaginary playmates, we'll talk about a, a tool I use called the Imaginary Friends Questionnaire, reported as real. We've talked about depersonalization and derealization. We've talked about mood switches, extreme behavioral changes this lying behavior, disavowed uh, um, witness behavior. We didn't talk about sometimes there's a severe headache before a change in behavior. Um, the other two are really also important, kind of gets back to your question, uh, the last one does anyway, but there's inadequate progress. This is a kid who's just not making progress. Why? Why can't they make progress in our system? Maybe it's dissociation. And the last one, treatment failures, but also lots of diagnoses. When I was at the COE and I'd see like this laundry list of diagnoses this kid had, bipolar, ODD, ADHD, PTSD, RAD, they had all these things, I'm thinking, hmm, I better look for dissociation. Maybe that's a simpler explanation for all these diagnoses. Um, so not any one of these necessarily mean anything, but these are the, as clusters, they, they, they mean something. So what happens when we see some of these things, we call it all these other things, right? We call it, we, we might call it manipulative and oppositional. When I was first called on the, the girl that was pooping her pull-ups 12 times a day, I got in on a child family team meeting. I didn't know much about the child at all. It was just like, we need you on the meeting. So I get on the phone and I'm listening and they're going, we've just got to have more consequences for this kid. We've tried everything. We need a better treatment plan. We need more consequences. And they're telling me what she's doing and it was lots of other things. And I said, whoa, everybody, can somebody tell me what happened to this child before we go any further? And then they began to tell me, well, we think she was sexually abused, and we know she was neglected, and she was removed from the home for physical abuse. And I'm like, oh, okay, why don't we do an assessment? Let's see what's going on. They were thinking she was manipulative and oppositional. She was very dissociative. Um, some people say bipolar disorder because of that mood lability. But let's take a look at it. Some of our kids do have bipolar illness and dissociation. Some of our kids have complex trauma with some dissociation and no bipolar, but we call it that. Medicine's not gonna fix that dissociation. Therapy's gonna fix dissociation. Psychosis, absolutely, because we do with every one of these kids. You heard me talking about these kids at the beginning, and the, the kid that wanted to get meep out of her head, 
you know she was looked at as psychotic. And again, we can have psychosis along with dissociation too, but hallucinations in and of themselves don't necessarily mean a true psychosis. A lot of times they're called severe ADHD, attention deficit, uh, severe o obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, substance abuse is often a part of that, um, reactive attachment disorder. They may meet criteria for all of these. But even if they do, we need to find that dissociation. So how do we figure it out? We want caregiver input. Uh, you guys have the PowerPoint with all these caregiver questions, but they're basically, the caregivers are the ones that are gonna see this stuff. You wanna find out about extreme switches in mood and behavior. You wanna find out if they deny aggressive behavior, if they have that kind of lying, disavowed, I didn't do that, and they really, they really seem like they didn't. Um, do they have memory problems for events that they should recall, like holidays, birthdays, past or present? Um, do they deny other behaviors or, or memories like that, that, that are problematic, like conversations with family members or school activities? Oops. Um, again, do you notice changes in the child's eyes? Are there changes in mannerisms that are perplexing? Has your child ever told you that he hears voices or sees things that people don't hear? You want the parent to describe those things. Have you ever heard your child talk to him or herself? This is, a hot, this is kind of a hallmark too. I had a foster mother with a 12-year-old boy and I was doing the child dissociative checklist with her and I got to, have you ever heard them talking to themselves? She goes, oh yes, every day he's in that bathroom. And, it's, and she goes, and I listen, I go up to the door and it's like there's a girl in there. And there's three of them. There's three kids, three different voices. She goes, sometimes I thought there were other kids in there. And they're just carrying on these conversations. So ask your caregivers these questions. Do they have imaginary playmates? Uh, when did you become aware of them? Children have imaginary playmates. Little ones do. I did. Mine was named Connie Wani. She did all the bad stuff. But I let her go when I was about five. Most kids let their imaginary friend go at least by seven. But if they're still hanging around and they have a certain quality to them that you begin to wonder if they're a part. And then do they have body ailments, complaints that don't have a medical cause? This is the child dissociative checklist. I would recommend this if you are an evaluator. It's Frank Putnam's measure. And scores of 12 or more are considered tentative indicators of sustained pathological dissociation. And these have a lot of those similar kind of questions. The questions I just showed you came from Fran Waters' book, by the way. This one is Frank Putnam's, and we use this one. Never diagnose off of this. Don't diagnose. Use it as more information because sometimes parents don't understand what the questions are really asking and that kind of thing. So b use it with a lot of judgment, but you're going, but if you, um, you can even find this online. This was Cheyenne's um, child dissociative checklist and you may notice her total was 29. And do you remember, you just need 12. Um, her mom's told me that she was shown a video of herself having a fit so they could show her this is what you do because she was always like, I don't do this. No, this is what you do. And she's like, that's not me. That is not me. She disavowed it on video. Um, that's how strong that part was. They said she's in her own world. She looks past you. Um, we can go to um, town at 10 and then again at one and she doesn't remember that we went at 10. So these are questions getting to forgetful and that kind of thing. You can see the little notes I put out here. Um, let's see, uh, okay, I think, but, but again, she, she came up really high on that scale. So we want youth input too, and this is a real balance. Um, kids have an intensity and need to find somebody to share the uniqueness of their internal world with, but they also need to protect their secret. So we have to be grounded with these kids. We have to let them know I accept all parts. I won't be shocked, frightened, or disgusted. I'm here for you, and I realize our time is really going fast. Attunement is really important. I'm open and curious about your experience. I see you, I don't judge you. I'm not here to change you, but to understand you. These children need safety, safety, safety. We need to understand their triggers. We need to understand how we do not overreact when they begin. When they begin to go into one of their shifts, we ground them. 
we might give them something grounding like water to drink or let's take a walk everything's okay I'm here I gotcha bring them down because the parts flare up when they're not feeling safe the parts flare up only under some kind of stressor so you're going to frame that if as, a, as an evaluator I frame the experience I see other children here who are in foster care who've had some of those same things happen to them that have happened to you and I've learned really really important things from them and I hope that I can begin to understand your inside so that I can understand what's happened to you um, so other ways to help children talk about dissociation I'm just going to flip through a couple things because I know our time's up but drawings this is a child that I said just draw yourself and you can see she drew all her inside parts all around her I didn't know she was dissociative till she drew herself and these parts on the inside right here she called these her ghosts and these are all her ghosts so she had very unformed parts these are not distinct personalities yet but they were getting activated and coming out and having a lot of behaviors she was an eight-year-old. This is a child who was 10, who was sexually abusing his little sister, and he was a victim of sexual abuse. And I asked him to draw his outside part and his inside part. And you can see there was quite a part. Once we got to that dark side and began to understand what it was all about, and he was clearly conscious of this dark side part, we were able to make lots of progress in therapy. Um, the color my heart, I'm going to skip. I wanted to show you these before we ended. One of you had asked on a, a question, what do we use to evaluate? We use the child dissociative uh, checklist that I already showed you for parents. And then we, we can use the adolescent, adolescent dissociative experiences scale. There's also a child dissociative experiences scale. And then there's an imaginary friend questionnaire. If you want to know more about these and, you're, and, and you want me to help you locate those, um, I can give you my card afterwards and help you get directed to those. But this is the Adolescent Dissociative Experiences Scale. There's 30 questions. Um, it's for ages 10 to 21. And, and it has all kinds of questions that are about dissociation. Once a child answers those, you want to give an interview about what they mean by it. Uh, this is a child, Jane, who had a subclinical score. She did not get to the clinical cutoff score on her adolescent dissociative experiences scale, but she said she had voices inside her head, and she said that there were other, she said that um, I hear voices in my head that aren't mine. I feel like there are different people inside of me, so I'm like, well, we're going to check that out. I gave her the imaginary friends questionnaire, which is, do you have an imaginary friend? She said, yes, that's the people inside of me. She answered several questions about them that were true. And then I asked her if she would tell me more and draw them. She drew her imaginary friends. They were two different ones, white one and black one. Again, not real well formed. One was nice, one was mean. One would, one would, black one helped her when she needed to be assertive. White one helped her when she needed to placate somebody. And they, this was a child who wasn't sleeping and that was one of her big problems. She was so tired in school. What I learned on interview is that either white one would be out or black one would be out all night long watching for abusers, making sure she didn't get abused. So this child had parts of her that never slept the whole night. That's why she was so tired. Once again, with some internal communication, the white one and black one learned that they were no longer back with the abuser. They were at a, a new place where nobody was going to hurt them and they settled down. We also got her a weighted blanket and she slept just fine after that. Um, child dissociative experiences scale, you have it in your PowerPoint where to get it. It's the same type of thing except for your young children. Um, boys and girls, they also have um, uh, ones for African American and Caucasian children and I think we've got to stop because my time's up. So I didn't quite get through but there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Okay, just please remember to fill out the survey, check your email for that. Um, appreciate you coming and thank you, Dr. Van Ace, for coming back to visit us at the CRE. You're COE. welcome. Next time I need uh, part two. <laughs>